how fucking difficult would it have been just to say, because it's gone to penalties, we, we, we can't sit around saying it's fucking great interviewing people who are just going to go, yeah, yeah, no, it's good to get over the line. I don't give a fuck, put on the actual match. <laughs> this is Paul McGrath. You're listening to the Villa Podcast. That morning sky gave me a look. So I left while you were sleeping. That's all it took. United, Brighton, Spurs, Chelsea, Newcastle, five wins in a row, scoring almost every bloody game, and still, still when it came down the stretch, down to the last three games, Villa needed seven points from Spurs, Liverpool, Brighton, and they got them all, every single one of them, they got them with skill, with tactics, with coaching, with discipline, with nerves of unshakable steel. Unai Emery didn't just rescue a season in the doldrums. He didn't just drag Aston Villa immediately away from teetering on that brink that we were on. Keep them off the beach as well at the same time. He kept them fighting. He kept a fire lit in all their bellies and in the underbelly of Villa Park. He kept them chasing after every single ball all the way to the last bloody second of the season and all the way to European football I have never never had the privilege of witnessing a club or a season or a group of players transform like this and Liam if you need any proof of how much things have changed it's always good to visit an old Conan Doherty tweet (laughs) Dip back into the archives, go back to the 24th of September, 2022. You know, things weren't great from an Aston Villa point of view. Ireland were even losing to Scotland. And Conan Doherty tweets out, McGinn with the showy double fist pump to the crowd before it was over for doing the first thing he did all game, win a fucking corner. (laughs) And with the final action of the season, I've never... (laughs) I have never been happier to see John McGinn, the man who I questioned. I questioned whether he could handle the armband as well. I questioned whether Emery needed to upgrade him. The man who turned himself back into the hero that we all love. I've never been happier to see him stick out his arse and win a corner, get those fists up to the crowd. And I, for one, was saluting him. This long, beautiful journey of a season came to you fitting and beautiful end I, I remember after our defeat to Arsenal third defeat in a row 11-5 on aggregate now that includes Man City and Arsenal and four individual errors against Leicester but it's <laughs> it's still 11 goals in three games and Unai comes out after the match and eviscerates the players very politely in demeanour obviously and in manner <laughs> it, was, you know, it was more a case of a parent saying I'm very disappointed in you rather than you're a useless bastard Mm. Probably important to clarify that our mother never called me a useless bastard, not as a child anyway. <laughs> but I remember, I remember thinking, Jesus, we're going to be okay. He is the fucking real deal because it was very clear that he knew what was going wrong as well. Like he, he knew what he had to fix, and rather than being happy with the first seven games when we won five, lost to Liverpool, and drew with Wolves, who we never beat, he said those results were irrelevant. Like they were, they were not a consequence of us playing well, having control of the game or implementing or understanding his game plan. Essentially, he said the players were just doing what Steven Gerrard wanted. They were showing Unai a bit more quality in the final <laughs> third. So he, so he knew all this, and then he fixed it. We, we conceded three goals in the next 10 games. One of them was a penalty from a dive, and one was Harvey Barnes's obligatory goal against Aston Villa. 18-3, <laughs> the aggregate score in those 10 games. And even in the last five games, when we won two, lost two, and drew one, we only conceded five goals. We conceded five goals in five games during our period of patchy form this is over the line. It's wow. it's been fucking remarkable. Like he doubled our points per game and he signed a 20 29 year old left back who was in the Spanish second division four years previously. Like he worked with the players and then he said, There you go, lads. Enjoy Prague, Poznan, and Tala next year. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? I really will enjoy it. And like, it's it's amazing how 
I said this before how pure Villa's charge to the Conference League was. Everybody wanted to listen to that crowd today. And he got very bloody nervy the same way that <laughs> that, that Brighton goal went in, just flattened everyone. And it wasn't until the 80th minute where everyone thought, okay, we can see the finishing line. Let's roll these boys on again. But like thousands of them meeting the bus outside the stadium. This is the common to seventh place. But I don't feel like it's necessarily the, the European push and that's definitely a big part of it and I can't wait, I can't wait for you and I Emery's Aston Villa to have two games a week next season, that's class <laughs> how good is life going to be but it's 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 the fact that everybody knows these boys are trying to win every match, that in itself is exciting, that's what gets fever going around a stadium and around a football club, however far it reaches around the globe Like there were all those people there cheering that bus and chanting all their names because finally Villa have that team that we've just been crying out for, a team that we can be proud of, a team that wants to win games, a team that are proud of the the bags that they're wearing. I know that can sound corny sometimes, but you see the players grabbing it afterwards. You see Douglas Louise laughing, stretching his arms out to say, like, this is my stadium. I own Villa Park. I am one of you. You're one of me. We're all part of the same thing. And for once, Finally, it does feel like everything is connected. Everything from the manager up above him to, from, to the owners, obviously, down to the pitch, to the stands, to the far-reaching elements of Aston Villa. Everybody's pulling in the same direction and everybody's just enjoying it. You <laughs> laughed at me on my birthday this year when I was like, what? what is the point of this? Like, I, just wanted to, I just wanted to enjoy myself. It's exactly what I was saying. That's all I was crying out for. It didn't matter where we finished. It was giving up so much of my time for Aston Villa. I wanted to be able to enjoy it. And of all the things you know, Emery's brought, he's brought togetherness, obviously, and he's brought enjoyment back into watching football. Yeah, and and I focus on the goals conceded just because it's so remarkable. But uh, you know that I've left out scoring in twenty games in a row, scoring in twenty six <laughs> of the last twenty seven games. That's the other thing. You're right. We're trying to win every game, and he's figured out how he's going to win every game. A couple of times it hasn't worked out, but it fucking invariably does. It's incredible, and it's the way we play. The just absolute joy, the aggression, the punch that he's got. It's just it's incredible. Yeah, well, let's talk about a couple of those times it didn't work out because we should have qualified for Europa League and we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only joking. Let's celebrate this game. Let's get into the goals. Firstly, we'll take a very quick break and we'll talk about the goals after that. All right, I said the man who just struts around Villa Park now, Douglas Louise, the way he did celebrate that goal, it was like, who else? Who else was it going to be? It was Douglas Louise doing that run again. He's just added this into his game under the United Emery. Not only can he control the match with his passing, with his touch, with his vision, and with his calmness on the ball, but he, he runs as well. He goes into space. He drives for it when he sees it, and he, he turns on the ball, and he just goes, and he, he gets Ramsey on the left, and, I mean, Ramsey bombs off his shoulder, lines up the backs, and then just waits. You think he might take the man on, but he's, he's thinking, actually, I think they're being a bit lazy there, dudes of the box. If I just hold this ball for a second, Dougie, do you want to get into that? Say, yeah, there you are. Here's the ball and bury that. <laughs> <laughs> lovely ball with Ramsey's left foot and a lovely finish from Douglas Louise. It's, an, it's absolutely incredible interplay initially, and then the movement of the ball, the pace, the following of the ball by the players chasing the ball that they've played up the pitch, that Emery punch, go, go, go. And there is just something about Jacob Ramsey in that position. You expect him to pick out a free man. He'll, he'll figure out the best way to do it, and he'll do it because he can do it whatever way he wants. He can stand the man up and go by him to the byline. He can step inside onto his right. He can play it first time. He knows who he's playing it to, and he knows how to get it to him every time. And I wasn't in any doubt that he was teeing that up for Doggy. He just needed to take Veltman for a quick walkies first. And he really needed it as well because he looked like he was fucking shitting himself as soon as Ramsey picked up the ball. <laughs> there was something nice about Ramsey sort of owning that side to himself. I really love what Alex Moreno has brought to the team. But it, it was definitely noticeable that Alex Moreno wasn't there underlap and overlap and just controlling the left-hand side like he does. And he does it well, but it felt like Ramsey was a bit more free to sort of explore that area of the pitch with a bit more 360 license because Luca Dean was holding back a bit more. Is there something in that? Was it, and It's not quite Jack Grealish Cancelo. Oh, he's a really good player. I'll just play it to him. But geez, Ramsey was just, it felt like he had more responsibility because Moreno wasn't going to take it off him. 
Well, yeah, Marino's not going past him, so Ramsey's role was different today. Ramsey was playing almost as an auxiliary left winger there today. It was, and it's something that he can easily do as well because that's something that massively come on this season. It's his ability with his left foot. It's 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 remarkable that he can just go either side. Now he's an absolute nightmare for defenders because, like I said, he's got pace, he's got ability when he gets onto the ball, and he can use both feet. He's got technique. His dribbling today was absolutely incredible at times. How quickly he shuffles the ball. He's just a brilliant footballer. And then when he gets to the byline, that's the bit that's special. He makes the right decision. Yeah. Brighton had an offside goal in between our first and second goal. And Sisu was offside on the left. Undav got the got the goal that was then disallowed. It was... Uh, I, like, this is the sort of one, isn't it? This is classic. I, I, I had an inclination to just complain about this anyway. <laughs> I was like, shouldn't be that easy. The switch of play to the left across into the box goal. <laughs> you might say to me, but they held the line. They 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 forced him to be offside. Sometimes I find myself not not out loud, even though I'm saying it out loud. No, I find myself. <laughs> I'm recording the Connor and then going to release it. <laughs> I find myself siding with these idiots who keep talking about our high line. I just think it's not it's not necessarily the high line in this case, but that was a bit. Oh, was that the high line that really stopped him getting in? Of course it was, actually. I feel like I'm burying myself into a hole here. <laughs> actually, it was a really good goal. It's a massive shame for Brighton. It was a good ball out to Nciso, and who pro- couldn't possibly have expected that Matt Cash, of all people, would be playing him onside or offside. Like Cash probably probably does all he can in forcing him back in the field, but then he... Then he kind of gives up and stands off. Like maybe he was expecting Leon Bailey to come back in and double up, but that is just schoolboy stuff. Like that's the first thing you're taught. To keep your eye on the ball. Don't expect Leon Bailey to cover back. It's absolutely <laughs> terrible to defend it from Matt Cash. And it's an absolutely delightful cross from Nciso once he gets it onto his right foot. Like I said, under no pressure. And it's a really good finish from Indav as well. Yeah, it was a very good cross in fairness. And Tom on Twitter did ask, did Matt Cash miss all the training for this, this high line that we've been employing? Because <laughs> it didn't seem that way. But the second goal, the John McGinn tackle goal, the John McGinn tackles goal. The, John McGinn has this really amazing quality of sly tackling people from behind and somehow coming out with the ball without them falling. He's, he's coming through the back of them. It's like, it's a classic. You can't do that. The refs are always going to give a free. But even though he's coming through the back of them, he doesn't seem to touch them. He's, he still gets the ball on the side. It's it's such a rare quality he has. And he gets back up and he, he wins the second ball. And then it comes to Bailey. And the first time ball is good. The When I first saw it, I thought he balls it up a little. I thought he played it too tight to defend her. But... But actually what it does is it makes Ramsey's mind up. He, he, he's so tight to the defender that he has to come across him. And the speed of Ramsey and the decision making there. And the second touch. This, I thought he'd just run out of road. Like Leon Bailey screws you over here. You've run out of road. And Ramsey's like, oh, no, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just drop it here for Ollie Watkins. Like if only, <laughs> only Jacob Ramsey in this sort of form can get Ollie Watkins going again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely incredible pressing from McGinn. You're right. I mean, the first... The first tackle on McAllister is absolutely brilliant. Anywhere on the pitch, on any football pitch, it's an incredible tackle. And he hasn't gone through the back of him. He's read Alexis McAllister like an open Dr. Zayas book there. And he's just anticipated where he's going. And to get back up and get pressure on the ball again, it's just incredible. It's ruthless and it's so intelligent to sense the opportunity. And JJ trusts him as well. Because as soon as McGinn goes to McAllister, JJ's gone on the counter-attack. Yeah. That go, go, go. And if it wasn't Leon Bailey, I'd say, what a great pass. But it is Leon Bailey, so I'm just going to assume he's misplaced his pass to Watkins. And then JJ, <laughs> JJ's come absolutely steaming through. Intentionally takes a heavy touch to draw the keeper out. Yeah. And <laughs> brilliantly to release it. Absolutely incredible goal. Yeah, I love 22-year-old Jacob Ramsey. <laughs> <laughs> this guy means business. He, know, he knows I'm not a child anymore. Not he's been playing. <laughs> Not like he's been playing like a child over the last few months or this season at all, but uh, he's, 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 I feel like he's really ready to step onto a new level. I don't get this excited about what could happen to a player between June and September the following year, but I am excited about Jacob Ramsey. I don't think the league is ready for what this guy can bring under Ian Emery. Well, what's he got in the last 12 games? Four goals, five assists. He, he's been an absolutely electric form since we spanked Bournemouth. It's, it's incredible. 
Yeah. The goal then that ruined the buzz for everybody was Undav got the second goal. It, well, the second goal, the one that actually counted. It's a, it's a free kick initially from that Ming's yellow card, which we were all wondering, was that even a foul? It, pro- it probably was. In hindsight, a foul <laughs> seemed like a hard yellow card. <laughs> It's a great header for Mundav to to set up the goal for himself, and he's uh he's buried it. But it's all because of the high line. <laughs> <laughs> and this is it. We were playing a high line from the free kick this time, and all these talk sport and Sky Sports knob jockeys have told us the high line was going to catch us out. And I have to say, here we are again. Here we are again. The high line catching us out for the first time in what I can remember, probably the last twelve weeks. It's it's, it's not the high line. There was more. <laughs> <laughs> there was more space between fucking Dougie and Dina than there is between Gabby Agbon and the horse's ears. Oh, Zonal and- Morgan, is that what we're going after? <laughs> and M- Ming seems surprised that these tactical geniuses have identified the weak post in the fence, just toss it in behind Douglas Louise. And Ming's, to be fair, does brilliantly to get back. He does absolutely terribly when he gets there, though. He can't be being skinned by Undav and not by his fucking forehead anyway. <laughs> I mean, it's a brilliant touch and a good finish from Inda, but come on, Tyrone. <sighs> come on, Tyrone. There were a lot of chances that I started feeling sorry for myself that the chances weren't going in later in the game. We're going to talk about those in the award categories, but first, we've got our final WhatsApp winges of the season to do. I spent a lot of the second half thinking... I'm not going to do a WhatsApp wind you about Bailey. I'm not <laughs> going to do a WhatsApp wind you about Bailey. Yeah, let, let's just enjoy the positivity. I know he's fallen on his arse, but I'm not going to do a WhatsApp wind you about Bailey. And as I was thinking that, I think I sent out a tweet to that effect as well. And just after it, just after I said, I'm not going to do it, we're going to just enjoy ourselves today. He tries to take a touch and it goes out for a throw in. <laughs> This is classic week's wage is fine. He's getting he's getting fined on the day everybody's partying. I have to pull him into the office to say, Yeah, sorry about that. Nice pass to Ramsey, but you're you're not getting paid. You're not getting paid, everybody else is. And you know why Austin pulled up the footage there? I don't know why I've I've relegated Austin to just my analytics lackey. Well he has to do something. <laughs> but yeah, I'm not I'm not going to do a WhatsApp wind you about Bailey. Do you know what I was doing for uh, the two hours before this game? Like, have what? a guess. Have a guess. You'll not get it right. Saying you're not going to do a WhatsApp point about Bailey. <laughs> I was I was dressed up as the Joker and having an unchoreographed fight with Batman at a three year old's birthday party. <laughs> it's a real thing. Getting them in a headlock. Uh, asking asking where the defender of Gotham City was now I'd have more faith in Harry Maguire defending the Stratford end I was calling him the dark shite I told him I told him I was just a decoy to lead him away from Catwoman who was meeting up with John Two-Faced Harry and all, all I could think about today was football obviously I'm not a children's entertainer Conan it was a terrible idea and Leon Bailey is not a conference league level footballer Conan it was a terrible <laughs> idea they dropped 30 million on him we all know the player we think he is thought he was and there's something in there and maybe he'll get it back and maybe one day I'll be all it'll be all right for me to tell Batman to go off you, you fucking useless cunt at a three year old's birthday party <laughs> was this planned was this an idea that was actually planned through or did you show up wearing the Joker outfit and then you saw somebody <laughs> dressed I, as Batman I was just walking around Dublin like I normally do, dressed as a joker on a Sunday afternoon, Conan, hoping that a child's birthday party would break out. No, about two months ago, I was drunk in a pub and a child's mother met me and asked me what I do whenever she was drunk as well. And she said, I love the stubborn. podcast. Will you show up wearing <laughs> the joker outfit? <laughs> do you remember that show, Trick or Happy TV, where he used to dress as a dog and then he would see the other dog and they'd run on each other and start having a fight like it was all impromptu? I sort of have that image in my head where you showed up thinking you were going to be the only character I was going to say Marvel <laughs> character uh, <laughs> the only other person getting fined is Emmy Martin it's just a classic trying to get the ball going trying to find Jacob Ramsey down the left straight out of play but the first WhatsApp wins is also about Emmy Martin is, and it is very simple what the fuck is Emmy Martin is waiting on <laughs> Because I'm all for these delayed passes. I get it. You know, I see Brighton do. I see Lewis Dunk become a hero because he can hold the ball 
on his studs, <laughs> wait for a player to press him, and then he passes it. I know why people do it. But Emmy Martin is, is delaying it on his line to then fuck it out in the general direction of Leon Bailey. <laughs> why would he possibly be risking giving away a goal to then clear it long to Leon Bailey? I said Emmy Martin is about, must have been... 20 games ago now, was definitely going to concede a goal this season from getting blocked down on his line because he was too calm, he was too casual with the ball at his feet. And I was wrong, Conan. And today was the closest as he got, and it was the last game of the season, and it wasn't really that close. It was Big Indov bumbling in towards him, and he didn't get there <laughs> in the end. It was grand. We're not qualified for the Conference League, like not that. <laughs> <laughs> Second WhatsApp winch is the worst first action I've seen on a football pitch. <laughs> Emmy Buendia coming on having the ball chipped over his head by Matoma. <laughs> he made up for that later on though by chipping it over a Stupian said. Good point. Good point. The third WhatsApp winch. You could tell you could tell the tension was in the air for this game. If Ollie Watkins was as good at taking a touch as he was complaining about a back pass, we'd be on to something. <laughs> Let's, Ollie Watkins, let's, the man with the best first touch in the Premier League. Yeah, the man who was through on goal and touches it straight to that big blonde defender who passes it back to the keeper. Let everybody else complain about the pass back. You just get the fucking touch of the ball and go through and take a shot. Yeah, but like Van Henke jumps because he thinks he's lobbed the keeper because he knows the goalkeeper can't use his hands now because he's fucking kicked it back to him. Van Henke knows that's the back pass and he's fucking shitting himself. But apparently fucking David Pubic Lice doesn't fucking understand that. <laughs> he was all fucking scratching her heads bizarrely enough today for most of that game. I mean, this lad has been a, a FIFA listed ref for three years. And I think he's guessing, Conan. Like, <laughs> he, he, he doesn't know what a foil is. Like, there's, there's no pattern to what he's doing. He's no. not trying to let it flow. He's not being a stickler for the rules. He's just blowing his whistle sometimes and pointing <laughs> towards one end of the pitch. He doesn't care which end. <laughs> I know you know all that but do you know what WhatsApp Winges knows that Ollie Walker should get the ball down and score <laughs> the fourth and final WhatsApp Winge has Douglas Louise lost a fucking plot <laughs> 93rd 94th minute it might have been we've got the ball oh brilliant Dougie the man I just said own Villa Park Gets the ball and just toe pokes it to the Brighton players. I think he was trying to find McGinn. It's like, what are you? We could have just kept the ball for the rest of this match. And our centre midfielder, the boy I wanted on the ball, just toe pokes it away at the moment I needed him most. He he was done. He was toast. He was he was finito in the parlance of you and your fourteen year old pals on Twitter. Like he he, <laughs> he he needed to come off from about the eighty fifth minute. But I'm sure I'm sure Emery, like the rest of us, had a look at the bench and thought. Well, I can't bring on fucking Leander Den Donkey. Like we're we're tr- we're trying to qualify. We're trying to qualify for Europe here, for fuck's sake. I'd rather have a thoroughbred out there, even if he looks like he's about five minutes away from ending up in a packet of little minced beef. I'd rather have that <laughs> than a donkey. Oh, brilliant. We're going to leave that there. We'll make WhatsApp wins a shorter in the spirit of the season, ending on a massive high. Who would have thought it? Eh? We'll see you after this. All these. Right, get over it. It's Aston Villa FC, not Jack Grealish FC. Get a fucking grip. (laughs) Somebody called me a wanker. Let us mourn. Somebody called me a freak. We've just gotten the news. It's devastating. We're upset. Somebody reported me to the Villa podcast on Twitter. (laughs) Do these people turn up to funerals or wakes saying, Come on, get over it. It's the Doherty family, not the great Auntie Margaret family. It's time to find out what Uncle Jimmy's really made of. Time for Auntie Barbara to step up. <laughs> Fucking psychopaths, let me mourn. I'll rally around the Doherty family. I want them to do well. I want them to succeed, but I'm fucking devastated. It's not going to be the same without Margaret. R.I.P. Auntie Margaret. Do you know when you're trying to enjoy something and then you remember all the things that could have gone wrong? (laughs) And you get pissed off all over again. You get thrown back into that moment all over again and you feel like 
you don't deserve to even enjoy the moment anymore. <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Christ. <laughs> Anybody looking to celebrate the Europa I, League? I, I, I think I think we need to stop this podcast. I don't want you going there, Conan. It's fine. We qualify for Europe. Don't worry about it. We can talk. We can talk about all these missed chances and good humor. Don't be letting yourself get dragged into the darkness. I was going to say, just skip forward. Just skip forward to the end of the podcast. <laughs> I actually should say stop to say now. Now that we know, we know that people don't listen the whole way to the end of the podcast. We should just let people know there's going to be a separate podcast like there always is at the end of the season, just a sort of generic wrap of the season. Of, uh, yeah, j- just just a heads up. So do subscribe if you haven't already been there. I feel like I'm ending the podcast now. I should, maybe I should just end the podcast <laughs> order and go into the pits of the Rosenthal Award, which starts... and Everybody's going to have the same reaction when I remind them that Leon Bailey hit the crossbar at the very start of the game. And we could have been off to a flyer. Jacob Ramsey, Ollie Watkins linking up that little drop off from Watkins. Ramsey, the burst, like the left winger burst. Yeah, let's 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 go to the line. Let's see what happens. The ball across. Bailey has time to take a touch. He gets it on to his left. He has time to pull the trigger after looking up, and he still decides to lift it. He lifts it off the crossbar. How has he done this? I know Gross got in and get a bit of a touch on it, but it was on the way up anyway. He just buried that one. The build up was so good. JJ's decision to carry it before he pops it off to Watkins as well, and Watkins' drop off is, as always, is perfect. And Bailey does quite well initially. He's calm. <laughs> is he really calm? Maybe he's just slow. Like he doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't know what he wants to do. Why am I, why am I pretending that he's probably being calm? Now the ball's probably just stuck between his feet. <laughs> Speaking of things that went really terribly in this match. The ball in between Kanza and Mings came out again and there was our boy Evan Ferguson flying in between the two of them and he balloons over as well. <laughs> yeah, that Bermuda Triangle is there. Like Mings, Mings has stepped up. Like he's, he's so far up he looks like he's about to start a surge from deep into the Brighton box even though they have the fucking ball. And Kanza, <laughs> Kanza stays back to give himself a head start and he obviously feels a bit guilty about cheating so he lets Ferguson have a run on him anyway before he starts tracking him back. He's a nice <laughs> lad like that. And then Evan Ferguson is obviously an even nicer lad. The guy knew I loved him for a reason. That's an absolutely dreadful finish from Ferguson. Mm. Very, very bad finish. Leon Bailey's right foot produced a bit of magic like we know it can. It just whipped around the corner. Not far, not far from I, the top corner. I'm not sure what's going wrong here. I mean, it's Leon Bailey on his right foot. Everything I knew about football was a lie. What the hell has that not nestled? <laughs> Why is Kamara playing centre back? <laughs> great, great tackle on Evan Ferguson, the poor fucker. But if you look, like, like, run the tapes again. Like Mings has shifted over to the left, Kanza shifted over to the left centre back, and Bobakar Kamara is in centre back, covering up for Evan Ferguson, who thinks he's about to score and he doesn't realise that he's got the best defensive midfielder hot on his heels. Yeah, I'm not even really sure what's happened there because Mings has gone over to left back, which he will fill in for once Marino's playing left wing. But that hasn't happened in this situation. And you're mm. right, Conda has just drifted over with him. But the best, the best angle of that is from behind our goal, from behind Demi Martinez, and you can just see Kamara staring at the ball, running yeah. at full speed, waiting, and he waits so well and puts in the tackle so perfectly. And he's robbed because they give a corner for it. But what a fucking recovery that was. And what a perfect tackle. Yeah, perfect tackle. Matt Cash did so well to nick one away from poor Evan Ferguson again. He, he nipped it in front of him and took it away from him. And then he got up and blocked a rebound as well, threw his arson away. And it was offside. But uh, <laughs> that probably just made all that the better for you. The, the delayed offside flag. I know you love that one. <laughs> Yeah, he's about fucking three yards offside though as well. That's the one I don't love. Put your fucking flag up, son. And you're right, Matt Cash does absolutely brilliantly. But again, the flag was so inconsistent. I mean, there was one, there was a flag in the 93rd minute when John McGinn had the ball and he turned out, turned away from Matoma. And ordinarily, that would be unbelievably irritating. But it was the one time I was fucking glad to see the flag from the referee. That's it. <laughs> because I knew Emmy Martinez was about to amble out to not take the free kick for about five minutes. <laughs> Just like Leon Bailey's right foot should be scoring from anywhere on the pitch, Douglas Louise off the crossbar from the corner, not good enough. It's fucking pathetic. I mean, he needs to be putting that away. 
that, that was that was a third or fourth goal at it as well. Like we we couldn't have created the chance for him any better. He had he had, <laughs> he had ten yards of space. It was on the quadrant. Put that in the fucking suck net, son. Yeah. Ah, uh, I never thought I would see a Rosenthal award so on the nose as I would today. <laughs> Jacob Ramsey of all people too. I mean, I was just thinking, I love 22-year-old Jacob Ramsey, but I am... Look, I'm not happy with Bailey, right? There's no need for him to play a ball like that. <laughs> there isn't. Like, no need for it to be bouncing up like that just in front of him. But come on, I don't care what sort of ball it is. Jacob Ramsey can bundle that in with, with any part of his body. Yeah, Bailey I... isn't blameless, but Ramsey should still score. I I think we probably should rename the award as the now the Jacob Ramsey Award. I mean, it's it's a much bigger miss than Ronnie Rossenthal. Yeah. I don't care how bad the ball is. Jacob Ramsey's in the net when he's hitting it, and it's absolutely ruthless from Dougie and McGinn and Bailey even before that, and then toothless from JJ. And you can see it from behind the goal as well. The ball hits off his left foot and his foot bends. And yeah. we were talking about him the last two games. Just tightened his ankle and just let the ball hit off his foot and go in. Do that again, JJ. <laughs> Yeah, would have capped off the decision to bring him back into the fantasy football team for the last week of the season. He he also missed that chance at the end. There's a couple more nominations, but that from the Buendia ball, like he talked about, and Ramsey, the keepers out fast. But when he missed, it was just I think that was around. Was it the 87 minute? And I was just like, can I not just relax? I can just score a goal. That's what I shouted out. Just score. Will you just save me heart a couple of years, please? Yeah, it's what a ball from Wendy. It, it, it's a good save, but it's a bit of a Neanderthal finish from someone as clever as Ramsey. I mean, yeah. The ball is sitting up, to be fair, but there's other things he could have done with that rather than just smash it straight down his throat. Douglas a wee free to look at Dean, gets it across on the volley to Watkins, asking a lot from that header. It works the keeper, but it's not a big chance. And then look at Dean to Ramsey, who flashes it across and... Well, flashes it across is probably a bit harsh. He plays it across to Ollie Watkins, who doesn't reach it. Yeah, it's it's an incredible the free kick. It's incredible from Dougie and Dinya. I mean, it's probably not ideal to be setting up a header from twelve yards out with a stand and start. And Watkins probably does everything he can from it. But a really, really nice piece of play. Austin McPhee pulls something out of the bag in the last game of the season. And the <laughs> the other one, I thought I thought Ram, thought Dinya held on to the ball too long, but then it's just a brilliant pass, brilliant ball into Ramsey. And it's a brilliant ball from JJ as well. Watkins just can't get there. Probably should gamble a bit earlier. Yeah, the only other nomination was the look at Dean free kick. It's not really a Rossenthal award for missing a free kick. But if Douglas Ruiz is getting blamed for missing a corner, <laughs> then we can quite that as well. But Ramsey is obviously the clear winner of this and the clear winner of the season. The biggest chance missed of the season on the last game of the season. Let's go to the Peter Enkelman What the Fuck Award. We had just find. Emmy Martin is for his distribution. We just talked about him almost getting blocked down. And his first pass to Kanza as well. He tries to roll to him and he just hits it into the ground. He just bumbles it into the ground. And he makes it worse. He does the Ming's thumbs up after. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's all okay. I mean, just to cap off the what the fuck nomination. It's all right. It's all right to copy Thoreau Ming's nowadays, Conan. I mean, back whenever yeah. Thoreau Ming's was doing that, it was an absolute disgrace. But it's fine now. If, if Thoreau Ming's gives you the thumbs up now, you know that everything's okay. Back then, you know that his head was fucking absolutely scrambled. And the only <laughs> motor function he had left was to raise his thumb like fucking Terminator getting melted. <laughs> The only other nomination I have is Leon Bailey trying the Bertie T crossfield. I mean, rather than the classic Bertie T one that gets intercepted in the middle, he just gets blocked down straight away and it deflects towards our fucking box and Kamara reaches out to intercept and then he has to he has to slightly tackle just to complete the regaining of control of the ball and the he just walks out with the ball. This guy is so cool sometimes. Like that <laughs> that that right there, Leon Bailey, you know, just charging inside trying to blast the ball to nobody getting blocked down and Kamara doing that like that was just the difference of of two souls right there for all of us to see <laughs> isn't it incredible how quickly Kamara has just settled back into the team and the, it's how he settles back into the team as well I actually forgot how calm he was on the ball and how effortless he is on it as well like he, he never seems flustered and he always 
but he always seems to get there before everybody as well. You know, he's, he's not, he never looks like he's expending energy, but obviously he is. He's playing center midfield and he's dominating yeah. the game and he's beating people to the ball and he's bullying them and he's opening up into space. It's just incredible how calm. Like he looks like Dimitar Berbatov playing in center midfield. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think Leon Bailey might win this one because Martinez's pass did make it to Kanza. <laughs> just uh, <laughs> saying something about the heart and the mouth feel about this whole game. The Tim Sherwood, we played two number 10s and bamboozled them award. What do you think of how we matched up against Brighton? It was like a 4-1-3-2 in defence, the way we pushed up. Dougie Louise had sort of gone into a bit more of attacking role in defence to get on Casado and... John McGinn was right up on them. They they were almost closing down the keeper a lot of it. I think it was really brave because Brighton, the one thing everybody notices about them was how well that they can get past the press. But I feel like Villa did really well on it. They they just matched up all over. You could see Mings following. Was it Undaf? He was following somebody into their half as well. They were going short for the ball. It was almost like Villa were man on man all over the pitch. I, re- I really hope any... Uh... In your trolls that had the three games to choose from today chose this game because it was probably a brilliant game of football to watch. I mean, I, I have no real idea myself because I was too fucking nervous watching it. <laughs> but I am really looking forward to the games next year already because both teams were so brave. Both teams stepped up against two teams that like to play the ball out and can be absolutely deadly once they do play out as well. So it was a really exciting game from that perspective. And both teams did it. I, I can't... I can't it, it is strange that we were so aggressive against a team that's been so confident on the ball and we did it really well as well. Maybe Brighton just weren't on it because they didn't need to be quite as quite mm. as on it as they have been in the past. But we had three players in the Brighton box at times whenever Brighton were trying to play out from the ball. It was it was mad stuff. And, you know, players you'd want to be tracking back as well. If we had John McGinn in there and we had Leon Bailey in there while well, they've got just their fullback out at left back. It's like, how are we going to who's going to get back there to them? It was really, <laughs> really aggressive, but it, it worked out really well. I think in the first half, we were let off the hook a little bit by Brighton because their passing was was not good. It wasn't sharp. They played the ball out of play a couple of times to massive ironic cheers, which was brilliant. But I think on another day, they might have punished us a lot better. But Jesus, I'm looking forward to watching it again next year. Mm. Does Zerbi did look a bit hungover? I was wondering, <laughs> was he or does he just always look like this? But he looked a bit rough, didn't he? Not even rough, he just looked like it wasn't as bothered. Of course he wasn't, their job's already done, but but almost like it was hurting him to just try and concentrate on this match for 90 minutes. <laughs> like he couldn't, he couldn't be bothered looking at it, it was hurting his brain. Yeah, but they're going to play the way they play anyway, so that should have had the least effect on them. If the players were hungover, that would have had a much bigger effect. I mean, because everybody's probably just came into the change room and said, do the, do the usual. Doesn't matter. <laughs> the, you like them. We didn't take a 90th minute penalty award. Only one nomination. Fitting that we should end the game with Austin McPhee. Who invited Emmy Buendia to hit a free kick? <laughs> I thought we were going well with this. And then suddenly Emmy Buendia is chancing his arm straight into the wall, of course. It's a very, very strange. And it was annoying as well because... They were. They all gave him, like you know, the confidence beforehand to hit it, and he's like, "Yeah, yeah, no, I'm definitely gonna do this. I'm definitely gonna <laughs> smash this off Van Hinka's face." It was bizarre, bizarre decision as well because Dougie had been warming himself up. Now his shooting wasn't wasn't exactly good today. He had a couple of long range drives from play that went flying, flying over the bar. Couldn't have been any mm. further from the actual posts. But you know, let's get real here, Douglas Louise had the crossbar from a corner let him hit the free kicks from fucking 25 yeah. yards out not Emmy not Emmy Buendia for the first time in the season strange no, it was, yeah it was a callback to the dark days at the start of this bloody season this long season just the, the come on down nature yeah. and you take your chance and, yeah and ironically of course and it's not lost on me that we also complained every time Douglas we stood over a free kick back in those days. <laughs> it was ah, like, I doubt it. Yeah. <laughs> but Douglas Louise did have a free kick, you're right. And it was that a sort of annoying Ronaldo trait where he just thought I'm far enough out, I'll I'll just spank this one with the with the laces or the outside of the boot almost. And it's like you can hit you can score from the corner flag. Just hit it with your instep. Just pick, <laughs> pick. <laughs> Pick a spot and hit it with your instep. Just do that. Yeah, like if you're gonna, if your objective is to go up and hit it as hard as you can, maybe don't shoot. I mean, like if you <laughs> if you think that's the best way of scoring, probably shouldn't bother shooting. Just fucking toss one into towards through the wings. 
Yeah. The Vyman meter going up. Tyrone Mings getting the call up to the England squad. Finally, a bit of justice there. Maybe Ollie Watkins is hard done by. I don't know. I don't want to get into another England discussion, do you? What do you think? <laughs> going up. Going up. Matoma for kicking the ball out for a goal kick every time he got the ball. <laughs> going up. John McGinn. Uh, I don't know if there's anything new to say about this guy. I think we said it all when we said he's playing at the level that he was playing at in the Championship only he's doing it in the Premier League. He looks too good for this league. He's but it's 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 that honesty that John McGinn brings, like that, that honesty that makes him too good as well. It's like somebody that good is playing with all that heart and all that just bundle of energy, tireless energy and the continuous running and it's so tactically clued in, knowing where to be, knowing like the example you pointed out with McAllister, just knowing when to pick guys' pockets and ah, just just Really set in the tempo, and like it probably fit me put him up in the last game because, like I alluded to at the top of the show, I did question one stage during this whole mad season that I think the captain's armband is weighing heavily on him, and that can happen to a player, and that's okay. <laughs> now it's like he is a proper leader because of the way he's playing. He's, I know everybody talks about how much they like him in the changing room, but even that would probably would have held against him when things were going wrong. It's like, oh yeah, I don't care if he dresses up as a fucking turkey, I want to win some matches. <laughs> But no, he's, he's really leading from the front. Like, and he was doing that literally today. And he's he's just somebody you would follow into battle. Like when he when he's on it like this, I, I wouldn't even want him replaced next year. I would just say, like, yeah, let's keep improving on this car. This is a good this is a good vehicle. I think if the if the season had ten more games left in it, then John McGinn would be winning the the Aston Villa Player of the Season, fans and players, because he's been absolutely incredible, particularly in the last 15, 20 games. I'd say Douglas Louise probably deserves to win it across the whole season. There's one in the second half as well. It just shows you the the mind frame it was in. First half, sorry, it was after we had we had had quite a few chances just out of nowhere. Brighton had the ball for a while, but we just kept peeling through them and getting chances. A couple of pullbacks didn't quite work out. And there was one that Watkins nods down to John McGinn. And I think we had gotten giddy at this stage because you're, you're not going to score your second goal of the season catching a half volley from a nod down going across your body, John. <laughs> come on. But it just shows you the the enthusiasm and joy that he's now playing with as well. And mixing that with the, with the grit and the aggression and the determination, all the things that we know John McGinn has got. He's been absolutely brilliant. Yeah. I'm going to put Luca Dean up. I thought he was really good. I've made light of the idea that he's our defensive option to Alex Moreno. I thought he was good defensively today. I know that Matt Cash was over there trying to deal with Nciso and then Matoma with Leon Bailey for help, but (laughs) it was just so quiet down Brighton's right-hand side, and I thought he was good on the ball. Yeah, it was good for somebody to be, you know, obviously second choice now to Alex Moreno always ready to step in which he has been over the last 10 15 games as well which has been crucial often coming on after an hour as well so he's actually really due a, a call out to to that spirit of the Andy Vyman thing as well this guy's just been there helping this this cause take along very well all season yeah absolutely he deserves to go for that and he does deserve to go up just on the Prior of his performance today he was really good on the ball he was good defensively made a lot of right decisions Passing was clean, crossing was good. That cross into Watkins, like I say, to catch a half, to catch a volley clean like that and play it across the box was absolutely gorgeous. Really good performance from a really good pro. Look at Dina as our second choice left back. Incredible. Yeah, that's true. Like the guy who was hired because Stephen Gerrard wanted to get real the January before, like get me some of these players in. And yeah, uh, now he's been upgraded on as such for Emory's system anyway. Going up, Kamara, Douglas Louise, Jacob Ramsey. Going up, Ollie Watkins. Back first touch was brilliant, apart from that one time that he was through. <laughs> <laughs> you know, linking up really well with Jacob Ramsey. Scoring the goal, which is always good to see. Yeah, putting him up this week. Yeah, I was very good. Great to get a goal as well to end the season. Get into number 15 as well for the season, which is a nice round number for him to have. Brilliant, brilliant player this season, particularly. I'd say if the season had to end the 10 games earlier, Ollie Watkins might be our player this season. Yeah. But uh, yeah, he's been quieter the last seven games, always giving us the effort, always giving us that Andy Vyman spirit, but it's good for him to get on the score sheet today because that's what he wants and that's what we want, obviously, as well. Going up... Marvellous Nakamba 
Literally, he's going up the town or going up Luton Town or going up and Marvis Nakamba is banging in penalties when it matters most at Wembley <laughs> Stadium. Can you imagine the absolute conniption I'd be having if I saw Marvelous Nakamba walking up to take a penalty <laughs> in a final for Aston Villa? <laughs> Fuck me. Going up, Carlisle. Congratulations to Carlisle, who we had to spend the first two minutes of the Aston Villa match <laughs> watching their players being interviewed because they got promoted from League Two and Sky didn't tell us that they were no longer showing the fucking Villa match. And yeah, I was there invested in these Carolina players and then I realized it was after half four. I'm still watching their celebrations. Oh you were you were actually invested in it. I wasn't fucking invested in it at all. I was just sitting there seething. How fucking difficult would it have been just to say uh, because because it's gone to penalties, we, we we can't sit around saying it's fucking great to interviewing people who are just going to go, yeah, yeah, no, it's good to get over the line. I don't give a fuck. Put on the actual match. <laughs> this was the other thing. Their match was over. It didn't like it wasn't. It wasn't like we were cutting away from a fourth penalty. They weren't cutting away from anything. But the match was gone. It was just getting down to the dregs of the interviews. Now at this stage, they had done loads of them. They'd done the manager. They'd done a couple of players. It was like, oh, let's get more reaction. They didn't do the they were getting reaction. <laughs> they were just getting a bunch of people who couldn't think straight, mumbling <laughs> on fucking camera. <laughs> Villa qualified for European football for the first time in 13 years and they cut straight away from that let's get over to Everton let's get over to like, <laughs> let's get over to Goodison Park couldn't get away from that quickly enough I was actually in the middle of watching Ollie Watkins grab his badge go over to the crowd had a thought to myself oh cool the fans aren't invading the pitch even though I like that I know it's a it's a contentious issue. People are divided on it. I'm not going to get into it. But I was I was happy in this case. Like, you know, I'm going to get to see all the players now doing their little sort of final home game. And what a, what a final home game. We've, we've achieved something we never thought we would have achieved. It was only yesterday, only yesterday, four years ago, we were getting promoted under Dean Smith, having come fifth, having been with Steve Bruce that same season. And now we're going to Europe and I wanted to see all the reaction. no. I had to go to Goodison Park to watch Everton slog out a 1-0 victory and they showed me all the reaction from that. I ended up getting invested in Jordan Pickford. I ended up watching all his interviews and all his hugs. The cam- he had like a personal cameraman following him around and there, there I was watching it all thinking, ah, they're going to cut back at some stage, are they? No, they went, to, they went to that studio then. They went to Jamie Carragher and whoever talking about Everton match. No more Villa. It's all over. Bye-bye. A big decision for him to talk about that is if that was the big story. Shit team fucking stumble over the line against a team who had nothing to play for after showing us fucking five minutes of Connor Cody just kicking the ball into the sky and it will be <laughs> failing to get it under control and Burnmouth just kicking it back to him. What a waste of fucking time. What does Uno Emery have to say for himself? Is he going to announce now that he's going to win the Conference League? Come on, get him on camera. <laughs> <laughs> Questions we can't answer, but probably will. Who do you think dressed the best at the Aston Villa end of season awards? Because Douglas Louise is obviously going up in the Vimey meter based on this game. He's won two player of the season awards as well. I think he's well worth them. But he did rock up in a sort of I don't like the look he was wearing a black blazer with a black shirt underneath and the shirt was wide open it almost looked like he was topless underneath the blazer and he came in with all the other Brazilians and you know Diego Carlos is there wearing a white shirt underneath it looks pretty fine to me he's got that what do you call that thing at the side of a blazer where it folds over I'm not sure what you call it but it's a sort of bigger dressier Sort of like what you would wear for a tuxedo. But speaking of tuxedos, Matt Cash was taking this thing seriously. Matt Cash was there wearing a dicky bow. Tyrone Mings just slagging him for his shoes. He said they were too big for him, but he looked apart. Ollie Watkins with a simple black tie. We could probably do a whole bloody podcast on this. Yeah, we probably could, but I won't be a fucking part of it. I mean, it was an award <laughs> ceremony. It was an award ceremony and they wore suits. And somebody who's talking about a fucking... A fashion segment on a football podcast doesn't even know what a lapel is. 
Like what? What do you think? <laughs> what do you think the talking point is here? Like what do you? What do you think the broadcastable content is here? Well, where, it's, like, it's, where, it's, where do you think this conversation is going, Conan? Like what? what I think it's the, going towards John Duran wearing trainers and Leon Bailey wearing a polo shirt underneath his black blazer. And what? And then I'm going to join in and go and say, "Oh, did you see his tie? Like what? <laughs> what did? What did you think of McGinn's winkle pickers? Was that? Was that for a bit of symmetry? If his arse sticking out in the other direction? Was it for balance? <laughs> was it form or was it function?" Like, what is wrong with you? You must be a fucking nightmare to go to a wedding with. Hey, hey, <laughs> I'll tell you what, hey, tell you what, big shout for Mickey to go tireless. And, and not because it's a formal <laughs> affair. I didn't think you had the neck for it, if I'm being honest. And I don't mean neck for it in, a, in the dairy sense of the expression of having the balls for it. I mean, his actual neck looks like a ball sack. Hey, hey, b- ballsy move, ballsy move for Jimmy to wear a splatoon tie so soon after Auntie Margaret's death. I bet you fucking watched the coronation for the pageantry, didn't you? Like, I was about to say, I was actually about to say there, at least weddings happen more often in the summer, so you're less likely to drift into fucking fantasy football talk. But then I remembered, end of July, start of August, is the worst time to have a conversation with you because you've got this fucking blank expression on your face and a heightened restlessness, even impatience, because all you want to do is steer the conversation back to whether or not you should go for Salah and Watkins to distinguish yourself from everyone else who's going with Almiron and Haaland and something about a double game week and some bollocks about someone else cooking and someone else's idol being finished, sadly. (laughs) Don't fucking talk to me about Mo Salah, who I captained today, and I'll never captain him again. The, how did you? How did your? Uh, how did your fantasy football team work out anyway? I heard your. I heard your fantasy is a bit of self-flagellation, humiliation. You know, you like to be demeaned and mocked. What's the? It was. <laughs> I was top of all my mini leagues till the last five games, and I absolutely fucking bottled. How did you finish the season, Conan? Yeah, well, we'll have a separate conversation on that as well with this fashion right. podcast. I do need you to go take a look at. Philip Coutinho, whatever I, I don't know. So underneath his, what did you say it was called, a lapel? Jesus underneath Christ. that, that would make sense because my friends in the media call the microphone a lapel mic because that's where it attaches. Oh my fucking God. <laughs> I never knew why it was called a lapel mic. But underneath... You know his... you pressed record, yeah? Press... You, pressed, you pressed record half an hour ago. Maybe you've forgotten. It's still recording. But hang on. Philip Coutinho has a horizontal thing coming out from underneath his breast out to above the other lapel and it's buttoned there. It's insane looking. And Tyrone Mings, he's got the white shirt. He's got the buttons open. I know I was slagging. I was slagging Dougie Louise, but Tyrone Mings looks like an Adonis when he's walking in, to be honest. Good for him. <laughs> All right. The only other question we can't answer, but probably will. I don't think you're going to enjoy this more than the other one. <laughs> <laughs> Who should I pick now? What would have happened if they gave Steven Gerrard the season? <laughs> so imagine Christian Purcell was working his magic and said, no, 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 no. Wes... Trust me, Nasef, trust me, this guy is it. We have to give him. I've seen this guy turn games around in the biggest occasions. We have to give him the full season. Trust me, it's going to turn. He's going to change the culture. He's going to change the mentality. Imagine Christian Perso gave him the season to say, look, do what you do. doesn't matter how low it gets. I know, Stevie, my idol. I know you can pull this back. <laughs> Just go and do it. So this is basically a... What do we call that section? Imagine young Barry and Milner stayed sliding doors moment. And I'm going to give you a little brief synopsis <laughs> of what does happen when they give Steven Gerrard a season. Think about how it impacts Brentford immediately because they would have qualified for the Conference League because the next game they don't meet Arn Dinks. They meet Steven Gerrard instead. They don't get spanked 4 0. They come away from Villa Park with a victory, and that's the victory that would have gotten them into European places. So we stumble along anyway from that other defeat, and we get to the World Cup where Matt Cash gets left at home because he's been dropped for Ezra Conza, like we know <laughs> Steven Gerrard was doing. Emmy Martinez isn't starting for Argentina because he's conceding two and a half goals per game at this rate. His confidence is shot as Mojo's gone. Geronimo really starts for Argentina because Villarreal are fucking flying under Unai Emery. <laughs> Argentina, therefore, go out to Australia. No 
no Emmy Martin is heroics they're out and that doesn't just mean that Messi doesn't win the World Cup or we see him draped in the Qatar robe you might be able to give me the the better name for that the proper name for it because I know you're into your fashion but it means Ronaldo doesn't go running away from the Premier League he doesn't go running away from United because he doesn't feel like he has to hide he doesn't feel like he has to hide from the Messi Ronaldo debate anymore he can stay as comfortable in his own skin Messi hasn't won a World Cup he stays at United they don't finish top four that means Liverpool would have finished top four, which means Gerard not being able to keep his job as denied Liverpool Champions League. <laughs> and on another podcast, we could get into, does that mean they do get Jude Bellingham? Does that mean that Borussia Dortmund do win the Bundesliga because Jude Bellingham feeling a bit better about life? He doesn't get injured mentally. He's in a better headspace. He wanted to go to Liverpool and now he's gone and he's going to be there available for that last game. They're not going to bottle it like my fantasy team. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Wasn't your fantasy team that bottled it, was it? <laughs> we get to January. Person needs to help his idol. Jared wants rid of Doggy Louise and Mings. They're stinking up the place. He doesn't like their attitude around the, around the dressing room because they're not playing. This is our player of the season and our England player. They're bombed out on the cheap. <laughs> Gerard needs proper leaders in, so... So Liverpool get their customary 15 million for a player they no longer need. James Milner comes back to Aston Villa in January. We are the ones who get Diego Carlos on loan because you know, the players aren't scoring. They're not scoring the goals that's being created. They're not creating the magic. Milner and Costa are proven winners. Good, good players that we know what you know. We know what we're going to get. They know the standard. The other players should learn from them. But we also need a leader in every line of the pitch. We need a leader at the back. We need someone to replace Tyrone Mings. Harry Maguire is bought for a club record fee. And we, <laughs> we stop podcasting. <laughs> Stephen Gerrard brings an end to the Villa podcast, to Lionel Messi's career, and to Liverpool winning the Champions League. <laughs> I, I think you've also left out the fact that Aston Villa undoubtedly get relegated. Because I, I think I've said this <laughs> I think I've said this before. The really the really horrible thing about Jared at the start of the season wasn't the lack of points we were picking up, it was who we weren't picking them up against. And if mm. that was how he was doing against those teams, the next three games, like you said, were Brentford, Saudi Arabia, and Man United. We ended up getting six points from those games, scoring more goals than we did in the previous eleven. <laughs> like we we were in such a bad way so far. From where we ended up, that we, I think we were, we ended up being eleven for four and a half years, just this season, just this season alone. Like it was insane. Like we 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 were played off the park in the first game of the season against Scott Parker's Bournemouth. There was no way Jared was ever gonna last. And then we we gave Frank Lampard one of his nineteen defeats in thirty games this season, and we gave Southampton one of their twenty five defeats of the season as well. That was what mm. Stephen Gerrard was able to do. This is the man who spent three million quid on Robin Olsen. Imagine, <laughs> imagine the damage he would have done if he was able to lamp on until January. Like you, you've mentioned a few possibilities there, but you fucking know we were going to Australia to pick up Danny Sturridge. You fucking. <laughs> You fucking know we were reversing a dump truck full of money up to Luis Suarez's Montevideo's mansion. Like, just just looking for that bit of quality in the round the box. Mings out, Dawson in, McGinn out, Joe Allen in. Emmy Martinez isn't fucking sticking around, is he? He's gone in January as well. It was a fucking disaster. Relegated. And that's why we can really, really enjoy what happened. How how is this the same season? How have we gone from Gerard to Ian Emery, one of her worst ever managers, to one of her best ever managers already? How have we gone from that, from the Bournemouth game, to one of our best, most enjoyable seasons in a long, long time? It's been absolutely incredible, the turnaround, what's happened. I've really thoroughly enjoyed it. Like If you think about even just how the other seasons petered out, I mean, the first... The the lockdown one where you know we had Emmy Martinez and we went in that run at the start of the season that that was great crack and then it sort of petered out. Last season was just we got a bit of a arc because Stephen Gerrard came in and it was like okay there's a different story point here but that very quickly got boring. We all decided to give him the summer. Let's see what happens and then it was just oh my god! Imagine a season of this. <laughs> and we've gone from that to this. It's unbelievable the fact that we were able to no longer cry out for international football like we used to do <laughs> like we used to do we're no longer slagging Aston Villa players on international bricks we're all one again and it's all because of you and I Emery and like I say 
we're not done for the season yet we are not done come back and get us for our season review like we always do but that means you have to subscribe so please do subscribe if you haven't already because it just means you'll get it in the feed whenever we do come back and that means as well when we come back for the start of next season for the start of european aston villa the villa podcast is going european and i can't fucking wait thanks a million for joining us all season it's honestly been a pleasure thanks so much for all the comments for all the shares it's it, it, it blows me away every time I see somebody sharing stuff so I do always appreciate it thank you Liam for being here and putting up with my nonsense all season I don't know why I'm doing a big Oscar speech here now when I've just said I'm going to be yeah, back play, in a couple play of days play the fucking music That's, that wind <laughs> is calling my name or whatever it is <laughs> play the music that you love that we're never going to get rid of we're going to play you out one last time thanks a million again and we'll we'll see you in a few days <laughs> see you later that wind is calling my name and I-